Suddenly we're in this remnant eucalypt woodland with Aboriginal community and the landowner and two scientists isolated and then the people start burning. The question to burn is an amazing one in this landscape. It's what shaped it. Tasmanian communities, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal, connecting on the same page, building something that's good for the future. This would be the first to cycle from the lowest point in Australia to the highest point in Australia, 2,000 kilometres away. I don't know whether we're going to do it or not, though. The tandem got driven into an underpass broken in a number of places. And that was before it even started riding. I fell out of the back of the troopy and had to go to hospital. My bum's definitely feeling it a bit. Get that into your belly, old mate. We're all stopping and starting a lot because we're just not fit yet. At least two of the people are actually quite at risk of, of, of dying. All suffering, a few tears. He's only ever cycled 12 kilometers and thought that he would have to go to hospital. Everyone has some form of disability. We've all got different challenges to overcome. When I'm at home riding my push bike, I am stuffed. Any kind of disability, you think I really can't do it. Once you're here, you go bit by bit, you can do it. Look at us. Disabled people are capable of first just like anybody else. Well, the good bit about the ride is... Um... Tasmania's unique wilderness offered the possibility of a prosperous future to a state that had always been the poorest in Australia. Instead, over three decades, the state government mortgaged Tasmania's future to one industry. Fuck off, where's that fucker? I was supposed to fuck a vehicle. Hey, 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 hey. What happens when the system fails and the real power lies not with the government but with a corporation? Everything uh, that we wanted is, is, uh, has happened. To me, the pulp mill is only a manifestation of the problem. It's not the problem. I was more concerned about what's happening to a whole democratic system. It's been undermined uh, consistently and systematically for decades now. It is an extraordinary story and a frightening one. It ought to focus the minds, frankly, of the boards of all major corporations. Logging was the untouchable industry and people who were arguing against it ran a great risk. I mean, we, at the coalface where citizens were out protesting against destruction of forests near them or which were of high wilderness value or great scenic value or had particularly rare endangered species, uh, could find themselves going to jail and did. Milaitina Pakanangini Ngayapi Ningimanina Takaina 
Milai Dina Pakana Pai Wutamanta Takaina Makara Milai Dina Pakana Pai Wutamanta In Tasmania, the Aboriginal history is mostly written into the landscape. What I mean by that is when we walk on the landscape, when we want to understand more about our old people and our old ways of life, the landscape and the resources and the heritage sites that were left by them tell us those stories. So by coming to places like this particular location where there is a massive amount of heritage sites, it gives us a huge amount of information about the way people lived. It's almost like an open book where we can stand here with our young'uns and with other community members and show them and tell them the stories of that way of life. Being on country here makes me feel connected to the ways of our old people. It gives me strength and it gives me a sense of being Aboriginal and being responsible for looking after this landscape so that I can share knowledge and pass that knowledge on to my children and to on, on to other Aboriginal people. The Latin name for these birds is Thalassaki quarter. We call them the shy albatross and they live in their thousands on this island in Bass Strait. When the conservation program started over 30 years ago and scientists started coming to the island, they were probably the first people to come without wanting to kill. This is one of only three islands in the world where shy albatross breed. When I came for the first time as a young volunteer, I had no idea what to expect. We travelled all night by boat and arrived as the sun was rising. To a climber, it's just the most sensational piece of rock in the world, really. While Paul was abseiling down, his abseil rope dislodged this rock, which hit him in the head. Hit him in the head. Going back to the totem pole for me was actually really quite important. I'm bloody nervous, but I think it is due to the fact that I've got a lot more to live for. I kept running into people saying, how are we going to stop Adani? And I got to thinking about that. We would take a convoy of a thousand people on a very long trip. We defend the future of our daughters, our sons, our grandkids. We are critical mass, and together we can look that monster dead in the eyes and say, it's your turn to be afraid of us now. People aspire to a free and fair press, but we don't have it. I could see columns talking up the potential of violence. Going into Claremont, I thought that there would be some kind of trouble. And then it kind of just built and built. Bob's not welcome in North Queensland, nor are these green. Let's stop it, Arnie. Let's have a beautiful time. Will you stand with me? Will you go to jail with me to stop this mine and save our future? I tell you this, we will win. We will win.
There we go. So I'm just going to, what, what we thought we'd do was just say a few words about our background, each of us, so you sort of get a bit of idea of where we're coming from. And sort of, I think that sort of helps you understand on how we got to where we are. And also I think it's, our, our background is actually part of our modicum of success in that, um, you know, so I've been taking photos now for, well, since I want a lot more hair, about 20 years or so. Um, primarily as a photojournalist, um, working for magazines, started out doing adventure sports, and then working for magazines and news agencies, um, um, and, have, and also then moved from doing still photos to shooting documentaries. Um, shot films, um, you can probably change that now, there you go. Shot films uh, all around the world, through the Middle East, um, in Africa, and a whole bunch of different places. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that because of that whole background, when we started Rumman, we have already have a network of places to pitch stories to. And I think um, part of the success of particularly making stories for NGOs and, and stories that have to try and have impact and reach, you've got to have the reach. You can't just make the film and have nowhere to go. So having that background, knowing photo editors and things like that also means you can get things out there, but also means you can make money or find other avenues. So you, you can sell magazine articles while you're making the film, or you can have an exhibition or whatever. So that all just adds to the reach of it. Um, so yeah, that's basically where I've come from. And so my background is, um, I'm, I guess, the producer, um, I didn't start off doing what I do now, obviously. Um, I grew up at Eagle Hawk Neck. So, um, you know, many moons ago, it was a much different landscape. So my background was really um, spending a lot of time in the outdoors, spending a lot of time on the water. And when I hit college, I had an SLR camera. I had a camera and I'd take lots of photos. And so the visual world around me was really exciting. And I sort of took that into the next stages of my life, sort of postgraduate after um, Victorian College of Arts, I studied dramatic art, so it was all about storytelling. And um, so I sort of had this visual storytelling combination going on at that point. And I was 21 and I decided I need to get further into the world and then I explored the Northern Territory and other parts of Australia and I was away for quite a few years and working in Indigenous communities and working in arts. Um, but storytelling was still a huge part of what I was doing or what I was influenced by because of those communities and the people that I was bonding with and connecting with. And one of the biggest things about being in the Northern Territory and working in Aboriginal arts actually was the amount of conversations around connection to country and we hear that term a lot. And I thought, God, I'm so connected to Tasmania. I'm fully Tasmanian, I need to go home now. So I did. Mm -hmm. And coming home for me was all about how do I reconnect with this place now? How do I explore what my core values are living here? Um, I came through uni at a time where, that was in Melbourne, and if you mentioned that you were Tasmanian, you were pretty much blacklisted. Like, you know, it was a no-go zone. It was something that it, you weren't really wearing proudly on your sleeve that you were actually Tasmanian at that point. But to me, it's so important, it's such an important part of me and it's such an important place that I know everybody in this room also feels connected to. Um, so year after year, it's been a case of, well, what's important to me and what do I want to talk about, what do I want to, want to share, and, and also then meeting other people to collaborate with. And Matt and I have been collaborating now for loads of time. Um, I started working production. Um, Stop. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Sorry, the image is okay. Just get carried away. I started working in production here when I came back from the NT and there wasn't... Um, I couldn't just jump back into the work that I'd been doing in Aboriginal arts, so I started crewing on productions and they were shooting television commercials here at the time on 35 mil, you know. So they were big budget, you know, for a bird's eye commercial, it was $1.5 million to make a bird's eye commercial, you know, for frozen peas. And we shot that on friendly beaches on the East Coast. 
Um, and I just worked my way up through production in different roles and eventually, because of that background in storytelling, I realised, hey, you know, I can actually start work collaborating with writers and, and directors and actually starting to make short dramas, short films and um, eventually into... Actually, at that point, I was filming myself too and doing a little bit of editing, so I shot something for the ABC, a little half hour that somehow made it onto the ABC. Um, and then just kept on sort of growing and making more stuff. And, you know, but the most satisfying thing for me has been to actually um, work with Matt in Ruman and actually produce the stories that we want to tell, the stories that mean the most to us. And, um, yeah, and it's been amazing to see how far the stories have actually gone around the world, to be honest. It's, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Mm. And, you know, putting Tassie on the screen has been um, a wonderful thing to do. Mm. Yeah, Rob, just want to go back. Um, don't be carried away with your finger, mate. Go back a couple, three, next one. There we go. So this is, um, this is kind of the mantra that by which we do everything, you know? Like it's, for, for, for us, it's, it's all about getting ideas into the world um, and so that's not so much inventing them, but it's getting them out there so that other people can see them, can bond with them, start conversations, bring people together, all that sort of stuff, you know? And we believe that you, you, you can't do that without wrapping it up in a story that people can relate to, people have moved by, um, and that, that, that base, you know, that's basically it. So, you know, for me, I come from a stills background and I firmly believe in the power of a still image to stop someone dead in their tracks. I mean, it's the same with a really good radio interview and film's no different. So us making films now, we, I mean, we don't just make films, we tell stories. So it's kind of like we do stills, we make films, we whatever it is, you know, and, and every story has different outcomes. And that's kind of how we make it work financially, but also um, that's how we get the best outcome for whichever story we're telling which this and the stories come from NGOs or you know environment groups or whatever so that's kind of the basic premise from from which we do everything and if there isn't if there isn't enough of a story there well you're just not going to get people to to engage with it for anything more than stop like your next thing you know and, and I think that's the problem with a lot of things today is that there's lots of stuff going by but as soon as you find something with some depth People just, just dive right in and connect with it. And the other thing we've found is that, particularly um, the stories we're making about Tasmania, there's an incredible, um, incredible desire and want and need to hear Tasmanian stories, even when people know them already, to see them well-crafted on a screen and be told things that maybe they know the entire story. Usually people know a little bit of it or they've heard a bit or whatever, but when they see it, you know, the, the Tasmanian audience and the appetite for stories, and I, I suspect this is the same anywhere, for stories about where you live is, is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and just go to the next one. And I think this is one of the biggest issues. You know, I know when the, when the Bush government got in, I know the Trump government got in, God, how many have there been? Um, there was a lot of talk in the photojournalism community in America about the fact that they'd failed because photojournalism is all about telling stories and they're like well if we had it done our job properly you couldn't possibly get this outcome yeah. so there's a lot of soul searching and I I believe today this is this is what we're facing you know we're facing battling the, the big end of town employing advertising agencies which are some of the most talented storytellers mm -hmm. <laughs> cashed up they're telling their story with these guys and our end of the spectrum has always either just got, you know, someone in the office to do it or been a bit too meek or whatever, you know, or hasn't invested the money because there hasn't ever been very much money, so there's always other priorities, all that sort of stuff. And I think that's where we've dropped the ball, but I think that's when there's incredible opportunity to, to bring people around and, and, and get the message out there in a, in a much better way. Mm. Definitely, I so agree with you. You're so <laughs> wow. And so, if anyone's got questions, questions are really good. <laughs> um, I was going to say something about story too, though. It's an ancient, it's an ancient <clears throat> thing that we've we've been doing for millennia. And and the story of Rapunzel. I'm working on some fairy tale stuff in this area over here, and um, that's a couple of thousand years old. That story's been rolling through. And the question is, why? Why? 
Why is that story passed on and passed on? And why is the story that you hear, why do you choose to retell it? Because it's a great story, but also it's transformed you in some way. So the power of story is about transformation. And if you're crafting, as we do, when we're crafting anything that we're creating, um, whether it be in print media, even um, uh, the way that you put catalogues together and books, you know, in, in, with the stills and, and um, all, of, all of the films, it's, it's to actually transform the reader, the viewer, the audience, and to, to have a, a mind and emotional shift at the same time. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is because what we're trying to do is educate people, but you don't say that out loud. Right? Because <laughs> education can be a bit of a dirty word, but it's true. It, storytelling is about lesson learning. It's about learning lessons and making changes, and that's what we want to do. Mm. Um, I have a couple of questions around, around the film and the leading to that, what you just said there. And uh, do people commission your films? Did you make them yourself and then offer them to people? How do you get them out there, and what impact do they have? Um, that's a lot of questions. Yes, um, <laughs> yeah, so generally, <laughs> yeah, so this is the, the tricky little matrix of how it all works. So we don't make films and hand them over sort of thing because that's not collaboration and the films will be rubbish if you tried that. Um, one of the amazing things is how much you learn what someone needs by actually making it with them and, and it works both ways, you know, like it's always a much better, you know, a much better tailored thing when you have the different people you know working together so we make the people we make films with are people we've been having dialogues with for you know a, a reasonable amount of time um, and they have a project that they want a film made made of um, generally it's it's also a whole package so it's a it'll be a film or a book and a bunch of outreach sort of stuff so and and they evolve they sort of grow so for example the albatross island project started as a simple artist in residency style model where myself and another artist richie wastel were invited to go to albatross island for two weeks um, when on their longest trip in september when the most activity when the birds are coming back to the island breeding <coughs> and stuff and then the idea was we'd have an, ex an exhibition would be the outcome we didn't really know what form that would take all that sort of stuff but we produced some work um, I did some magazine articles, um, sort of got the word out there. Then we talked to a few philanthropists. We showed the philanthropists the work, which was pretty amazing because we were actually sending emails and it hadn't occurred to me. Or well, just for some reason, I hadn't sent any pictures. And I, one afternoon, I thought, geez, I haven't sent this guy any photos. So I emailed him some photos and like literally instantly, he's sitting down on the, in the curb of Pitt Street in Sydney going, this is incredible. I want to support this. And so suddenly we've got $30,000 worth of framing and we, we've got, we can actually put together a show that's big enough because what we wanted to, wanted to happen was people to walk into a gallery and be blown away in the same way we were when we arrived at the island. Now, people can't go there so we have to try and give them an experience to show them how amazing the place is and then, and then with the, with the um, catalogue and the essays to try and make them realise that the custodians of these incredible animals were also amazing because the, 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 you, you've got to care. People care about people and you want to know that the people that are looking after the, 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 you know, the environment are really good people and you want to know how all that sort of fits together to be a, a bigger picture thing. So that was the exhibition and from that, that sort of rolled on to, well, we can make a film and then we got, because we had the exhibition, we had this resource to go for funding to show that we had an amazing thing to get funding to then go back for another two years and make the film. And it was a four year process in the end because it sort of takes to do a, something like that. It, it, it takes a really long time because you, can't, you can only go to the island for small amounts of time, but you have to learn. I mean, I have to learn what the scientists are going to do and I have to learn what the birds are going to do. So I'm always there before it happens to capture the, you know, the action or whatever. So I sort of had to spend a year learning and then working it all out and then a year going back and actually doing the filming. Um, and then that went on to, then at the end of the film, then we had made an education resource. So now the, the curriculum in Tasmania has an education pack for the art students so they can, so now it's been taught in the schools and, and um, oh, there was another project to come in over it, which was a, um, adventure class, expedition class, which is a, another curriculum thing where um, 
they made a, a curriculum for much younger you know, primary school kids. So we were working on a completely different job, went into snug primary and the whole room's full of albatross. And then the, the kids got up and did an albatross dance. It was like, no one knew this island was there before that. You know? So that was, that's a pretty, pretty amazing sort of the flow on. And then the, the films got on to win awards and travelled overseas and all that sort of thing. So you just never know. You know? The good thing is that you start with one thing and you just got to look for opportunities and other places that can fit, you know. We've now done virtual reality, little VR films. So at the science shows and stuff, you need something really interactive so you can whack, kids turn up and you whack the goggles on and there they are standing in the middle of a, a, a albatross colony looking around and birds are flying past and just little things like that to try and connect, just to weld people on to, to the idea that these things are amazing and worth, you know, protecting. One thing I've noticed is that every project pretty much every project is its own self-contained entity from woe to go. So it has um, different collaborat collaborators, a different funding model. You know, you might be working with an NGO or you might be crowdfunding or it might be a combination of both. Um, they're all different and so one of the reasons is, and I know this might sound a bit strange because you think after seeing them, our audience is probably always the same. It's not true. It's definitely not true. And each project, therefore, has a different um, audience uh, group or groups, and they cross over in different ways. And so how to reach those audiences becomes uh, different as well. So each project, um, is a, there's a learning curve in what platform it's releasing on, who you're partnering with to get it seen, what festivals it's going into, and who wants to come in and partner, because there's lots of people that say, oh, we're not so much interested in this one, but we're really interested in this and we want to actually get on board because that ties in with what we're doing and we'd really like to collaborate. So, um, you know, lowest to highest, um, I got an email the other day saying, you know, the Australian High Commission um, is interested in playing this in Tonga, you know, putting the, the film on for National Disability Day, you know, things like that. And it's, you know, it's played in South Africa as well. I mean, there's this completely random things that can happen um, after the film has been made. But yes, they're always, always different, a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah, and those, each project. And those, those like, lowest to highest and the totem pole, of the totem pole, what's that called? Um, doing doing it scared. scared. So th that doing it scared was a bit different because it's like the last piece of a puzzle in a very long, very famous climbing story. So mm -hmm. Paul, you know, Paul had the injury and wrote a book about it. No, he, before that, he was one of the best climbers in the world. He wrote a book about his life that won the Board of Tasker, which is the biggest mountaineering, you know, riding in the world, book prize in the world with the money. Gets around the world ticket, flies around the world. One of the places he comes to is here. Rock falls on his head. Writes a book about that. Wins a Board of Tasker a second time. Only person ever to have it, done it twice. So he's got a huge following. 18 years later, he goes, I think I can go back and have a crack at it. I'm like, you beauty. So you've, you've already got this massive audience and he's been going to mountain film festivals for years and winning prizes and, and we're like, we've well, got the last piece of the puzzle and it's only going to take one night, one night out and two days of filming to shoot it. So it's, it's actually something you can do. You can go and do it totally on spec, even though I'm like, if, if we don't bugger this up, we're, we're laughing. Combined with, he's got a huge following, so it's a doozy for crowdfunding. He's got, the thing with crowdfunding is you've got to have a crowd. Mm -hmm. He's got a crowd. So, the, so that film and Lowest to Highest were entirely crowdfunded because he had a, a crowd. And, and Lowest to Highest, not only was it his personal crowd, but we got internationally famous mountaineers that have got 500,000 followers on Facebook and stuff that he knows, but that also put it out there. So, because crowdfunding is essentially, you get about 3% return on the amount of people that watch the trailer. That seems to, to me to be about how many people actually get to the end of the trial and click, I'll give you some cash. So you need to have a really big crowd if you want to make, make much money. So having people that already have a crowd is, is really, really important. Um, combined with, um, because that's a disability film, there's disability organisations which are pretty cash strapped, but you can still get a couple of thousand bucks out of them and, and their email list. So it goes out, so the crowd gets bigger. So. For those films, they're primarily crowdfunded. For the Albatross Island thing, it was a much more hodgepodge. There was a bunch of little grants. We got some science grants. We sold magazine articles. We got money for a philanthropist. Um, I don't think we've got any money to shoot that. 
do the shoot, but it didn't cost anything. So, you know, the department was paying for me to be on the island. Well, not paying me, but my expenses, so it was just time. Um, so, you know, there's that sort of a completely different mix, but once we'd shot the film, we got some money to edit it from a, a sort of science film grant round. Um, and the, it was the similar thing with the, um, with the fire film. We got a little bit of money from the Aboriginal community. We shot a separate side film promoting the, the, the University of Tasmania science work, which is completely separate. It was just a little promo film for them on the side. And we got a really small grant from a, a local philanthropist that gives out a couple of thousand dollar grants, which is just brilliant, that just all just chipped in, you know. So, so the budgets, um, you know, that, that's the other thing you need to realise with these films. So, the budgets range from you know eighty thousand dollars down to five thousand dollars, just depending on the film. They're not all the same, and but the budget to make the film is only that's one thing. You know they all have lives that go on, and it's fascinating to see where they end up. And and one thing can often lead to something completely separately. So, for example, um, a major film festival in the states, there. Um, person who was commissioning films saw doing it scared in Banff and two years later was back in uh, Banff again and saw the Albatross film and then said I want that in my film festival and suddenly we're showing it a significant festival in New York to National Geographic people and stuff like that so you just never really know and and then weirdly that film festival was sponsored by Cornell University Department of uh, Ornithology so suddenly there's this you know, university that's totally into birds going, we want to work with you guys. And you're just like, who knows where that's going to go. But it's just... It it's like just Cornell, Cornell. Yeah, University. yeah. Mm. So it's just, you know, it's just that sort of thing of just always being on the lookout for opportunities and just trying to find every way to make it work that you can, really. You got to swan around in the Explorers Club, didn't you? Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been cool. <clears> hmm. <throat> There's a basic thread through, through all of the stories, though, and that they're totally human mm. reactive. So people are going to be very, very um, responsive straight off. The imagery is absolutely stunning, which is always going to capture people. But then one of the things that I've found since I've moved here in, in, from 1991 is when I first came, I always had this sense that people felt kind of embarrassed that they were Tasmanian. And through some of this sort of work that's been presented on such a high level, it has actually given people so much pride mm -hmm. um, and strength about the fact that this is a beautiful, wonderful place and mm -hmm. that we do need to actually make sure that we protect it. Mm -hmm. And that sort of storytelling is a way for people to feel that and be able to help produce but chipping in. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think so. Could, yeah. That's nice to hear. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think presenting it um, <clears throat> I know from the work that I initially did with the land conservancy, I you know I've been told by a number of different philanthropists that the first thing that they notice is the incredible imagery in the professional front. And then they go and look at the annual report to see if the, it's got the back back end. Mm -hmm. But they're never going to get there if they don't don't get stopped dead by the beautiful brochures and all that kind of stuff. So if you have an organisation that relies on, you know, funding from those sorts of models, that's that's a really strong, good place to invest. And, and I think one of the mistakes a lot of organisations do for a whole bunch of legitimate reasons is either just get the comms person to take the photos or whoever's in the, you know, office or, you know, little son, someone's doing photography or whatever it is, and they do an OK job, but... But it's competitive, you know. <laughs> it's, mm. You know, there's only so much money and funds, and mm. and I just figure if you're going to do all this amazing work, mm. what's the point if you're not going to? No one's going to know about it, yeah. you know. And, and these, you know, people are really passionate, and they're they're working their guts out and doing extraordinary things with very little. But the problem is, that not many people know about it, mm. you know. So. Mm. So storytelling is at the heart of what you guys do. Because two words that epitomise what you are as storytellers. So what is a story? I guess this is because it's obviously related to human psychology, you know, our identities and so on, and you know, the point of time where we are on this planet. What makes a story, like you sort of alluded to that about Goldilocks, what makes a story a very good question. catch and how do you guys come up with 
like a, this intuitive thing that happens at 2 a.m. in the morning and you meet each other up at 2 a.m. And... <laughs> <laughs> it's usually not as, um, it's not complicated. It's not complicated, but it takes many, many years to mm. actually deliver. And what I mean by that is, when we hear a good story, you, your hair's raised on your arms and you, you feel that tickle down your spine, you know? And I know there are story, storytellers in the room, I'm looking at one right now. <laughs> um, but, but it's about... Because we get, we get a lot of people coming to us and pitching ideas and they want us, want us to work with them on, on a project. And um, it's difficult sometimes because Yes, that's an interesting, it's a, it's a damn interesting issue or, 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 or there's something significant happening and yes, that should be documented and covered. But I still haven't heard the story. So, and I still ha I can't think of what that story could be or I haven't met the person yet who's, who's in charge of that thing um, to tell a story around what they're doing, you know. Yeah. So, so it's always a human vehicle for the story, is that no, well, there has to be a narrative. There has to be layers, yeah. and there has to be a narrative because, like, how are we going to drive this thing forward? You know, and, and I guess that's the problem. Someone like you ha has with wilderness imagery is like, so what? What's what's driving? You know, all these incredible images on. You know, what's mm. keeping us watching them? Other than the fact they're all beautiful, but at some point you go, well, they're all beautiful. You know, <laughs> so. That, you know, that's the issue. Mm. Um, but having said that, you know, other times you know there's a story there, you just mm. don't know what it is. You mm. know, like with the convoy, you know, we, you, you got mm. Bob and a thousand people <laughs> driving up the highway to central Queensland. You know something's going to happen, mm. but you don't know what. You know, you've got an election, <laughs> you don't know what the outcome is. Mm. So how you film, like how you frame things and how you ask questions, is generally based on a knowledge like I was saying with the albatross thing, it takes a year to work out what the albatross are doing, so I know when the light's perfect, I can run up the hill and I know they're going to pop up over the cliff into the sunset. But when you're shooting a doco that's happening and you've only got one chance, there's all these, you just, you try, you're, it's that, it can be incredibly frustrating <laughs> and, and challenging trying to find, no, you know there's something there, yeah. but particularly when you have goalposts that you don't mm. know where they are, like an election, for example. Mm. But that's why you, you have great instincts. So on a shoot like the convoy, you have great instincts because you know, I'm going to cover this, I'm going to go over there and cover that, and tomorrow I'm definitely going to cover this. And then a lot of the storytelling in that particular situation happens in the edit. Mm. So it's directing sure the, the, the edit, yeah, to actually to craft it. I mean, I think before what I mentioned about transformation, that we want to alter or for audience to have an experience. And that usually happens when people have empathy for what they're seeing and what they're hearing. And it's not easy to always have you all suddenly empathise with what's going on. So, so the craft is uh, along the lines usually in, in good stories. And I, you know, as a kid um, sitting at the dinner table, we'd finish our dinner, and this was every night, my dad would suddenly t start telling mm -hmm. stories. And because he was a fisherman, I mean, he had some great stories about the weather and the ocean and the rocks and the time that guy fell in the water. And so you're hanging on like this, you go, oh my God, then, then what happened, then what happened? So usually good storytelling is about a person overcoming obstacles or, or a situation where people are challenged or it is a challenge and there are obstacles to overcome. And usually putting your protagonist under pressure and then just when you think your protagonist is getting out of the swamp, you put them under more pressure and you put their head under the mud, you know, and then, yeah, it's truly. And then, and so a, a good story is all about tension and pressure. And there's a moment, I think, where you want everybody in the audience to have empathy and go, oh, that person has no idea what they're doing right now. <laughs> oh, I know how that feels. I know how that feels. And that's that moment of empathy where you go, oh my God. Mm. Yeah, so you can start relating to, you know, Rachel on the island when she's doing some crazy stuff and you start going, God, she looks freezing. Or, you know, or she hasn't been home. I think that's one of the mm. most beautiful parts of the story that she says right at the end, you know, um, I've missed out on so much at home by doing this scientific work, you know, and you start to go, oh, wow, yeah. So it's about making that connection with audience through um, trying to have them empathise with what's happening. 
So yeah, there's lots of opportunities to do that with um, our stories that we've got to tell here mm. in Tassie. And I think the other, the other tricky, the difficult thing is, is when something happens, you've only got one chance to get it. So you've got to get it, not really knowing if you're going to need it, but in a way that doesn't affect, you know, adversely affect whoever your subject matter is, you know, or the, you know, the people or whatever. So, for example, in the Convoy film, there was a situation where halfway through this festival in Queensland, a guy rides in on a horse and ends up running into a gate which swings and hits this woman and she flies through the air and lands and for all intents and purposes is dead. Like, that's what it appeared to be. My job was to run over there and take a photo. Take lots of photos of her. Because <laughs> that's my job, you know? And, and people are literally dragging me away from her and I had to fight them off and then they were holding up a, a you know, a blankety thing mm. and I've got one hand holding it away and I'm taking these photos because no one else is going to yeah. and no one's going to know this happened and it really is an issue of what you do with them after you've taken them. I'm not affecting her in any way by doing it but without those and, and those, so those photos got published you know around the place and they're in the film and all that sort of stuff but if you stand back and start thinking is this an issue or whatever you don't you know my, your job is to get in there and tell a story Keep and records. yeah yeah and, and you know at the time when people were dragging away and you know my defense because the simplest defense was it's evidence mm -hmm. and that's where I ended up it all went to court last week with all those photos you know so mm -hmm. at the base level there's that but but I'm actually concerned about you, if we don't show this is what happens, no one's going to believe this is what happened because it's an outrageous thing that just happened. So the logical response to being told what happened is to not believe it, particularly when the other whole half of the spectrum is telling you that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So that's, there's that sort of side to it too, is just making sure that when, when you see something significant happens, you know, or you see a significant part of a story you're trying to tell, you, you, you can't be shy. You, you have to get in there and, and get it. You almost got trampled by a horse, though, at the same time. I mean, here's the producer going, oh my god, look at him! The horse is running at you, literally. Yeah, it makes anyway. for a better photo. Yeah, it does make for a better photo. <laughs> That's true. What's that, sorry? Do all good stories have to have a happy ending? No. No. Sometimes. no. We, need to, we need to cry, too. There's got to be, there's tragedy. You um, just got to have good endings. Just ha yeah, just got to have good endings. <laughs> they just can't stop. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, and a classic example of that is, is lowest to lowest highest. To highest. But one of the guys did die. You know? Yes. Luckily, he didn't die on the trip, but he died. Um, he didn't finish the trip, and he went back to try and finish it by himself, and died in his sleep mm. a month later. Mm. So. And that's exactly right, because suddenly we had to go so then, back into the that? edit. We've, how do you deal with that? We've the film. Is that part yeah. of the film, or is that, mm. is that a completely different thing, you know? So, and we bashed each other up over that for a while. We did. <laughs> we did. So, yeah, so you just never quite know what's going to... Because as, as um, I mean, as we know, the word of mouth is so important, and, you know, people coming out of the cinema, if they've really had a great experience watching that film, they'll be talking about it and they'll be elated and they'll, you know, whereas if people come out of the cinema and they're crying and they're really upset and they're really quiet. But that's not a bad thing if it's told well, because that can be quite a reflective thing and then you talk about it. So it's a different euphoria, but it's still important, I think. It's, yeah. yeah. And I think also with films for, um, Films for affecting change, you've got to have a, you know, it doesn't matter if people are upset, as long as they have some, you, you give them something to do, <laughs> there's an action, mm. there's no, otherwise it's, you know, you don't want people to feel hopeless, like hopeless. No. Yeah. No. It could be said that the themes of all the important films now are actually converging, right, because of the time that we're in, and, you know, and the issues are really crystallising and they're polarising. And so many film, you know, so many stories, are aspects of that bigger story. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it's probably quite a fair comment. And it's unprecedented. Yeah. Like it's, it's really you know, increasingly so, but it's utterly unprecedented. So for me, the question is, yes, we've got great content out there and we're all watching it on as we're scrolling through our news feeds, but we, we want people to act. Mm. How often have you um, had a killer 
film that you wanted to make about an issue and you've had to walk away because the characters don't work. How important are the characters mm. not being themselves? I mean, we've more, had more trouble with access because of who controls it, the characters, so people work for the government and things like that are yeah. more of an issue for us. I, I think mean. the Guns documentary, that's, that was tricky with um, yeah, John Gay. He oh, and even, basically even, wouldn't give interviews at all. And yeah, and, and no one would fund it because they didn't want to get bogged down in no, legal stuff. That's right. And, mm. and then after the fact, then they're like, it's old news. Like, well, you can't have it mm. both ways. <laughs> So yeah, but we haven't we haven't had any characters. I mean, we had we it was extremely challenging with lowest to highest because you've got five guys with disabilities, you know, that all I just have all their own like they have a lot of issues. Mm. Put them all together, there's just issues of rama, and then you put a film crew together, which is another whole bunch of issues. <laughs> it's just this group of issues moving through the desert. <laughs> 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 so, so yeah, so that you know, that's it. it's challenging, and also you know, it's I forget, and it's part of my job is to not even think about how confronting, and it's something I'm trying to work on. It's how confronting it is to have a camera shoved in your face, because part of me has to not think about that, because if you think about it, you wouldn't do it. But at the same time, you know, you, you know, trying to build some, just be a little bit more thoughtful about that. You know, I I just assume. Characters that are going along with me, I have a have fine with it, and it's usually not until I look at the editor afterwards, and then they, they're comfortable enough to go, oh, you know, I don't, didn't really like that. I'm like, oh, sorry, <laughs> you know, just you know, just you know, it's it's confronting seeing yourself on a big screen and stuff like that, you know. But I think it's if you have if you're doing some work, if you're a scientist now, it's you can't not do it. Like I just, I just, it's a cop out. You just forget it's science, you know. If you're not. If you're not going to get out there and push it, what's the point of doing it? That's that's the way I see it. And, and with those characters, have you ever had to push a character to be more compelling than they actually kind of are? Oh, well, that's the art of an interview, isn't it? I mean, an edit, yeah. Yeah. But gen yeah, generally yeah. not. I don't. Th I would never use the word push. I would in engage and invite, and it's you know. I'm just thinking of something we did. Um, we made a film about the um, the survey that happened in the recent the World Heritage Exten Extension, and so we were interviewing some people around that. And um, yeah, it's just how to how to get the best story out of somebody, and how to make them feel comfortable to engage and to open up and to share. Because at the end of the day, what really works on screen is emotion. So you want you know, you don't want the person to get really upset or cry, but you want them to open, open up and open their heart because the authenticity is around truth. We know that, but you can't manufacture that. It has to be authentic. And so it's about that invitation to have the person open up and share yeah. authentically. Mm. I think the big challenge we have in Australia and even more so in Tasmania is that people tend to talk things down. They've just done something amazing get him in the interview and you tell him, oh, there's nothing. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, that's right. Dude, <laughs> yeah. he just crawled out of the jaws of a shark. What are you talking about? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> so that, you know, whereas Americans, you know, will just, oh. you know, they're just good at it. They're good at projecting. It's part of the, you yeah. know. Whereas Australians and Tasmanians even more so, they just, it, it's, I guess it's a, a tall poppy thing. It's, I don't know what it is, but it's, hmm. it's very hard for people to, you know, say, you know, with Rachel on Albatross Island, I'd say, mm. it, you know, that what you're doing is amazing. She goes, it's not amazing, I do it all the time. I'm like, mm -hmm. you, you do it all the time. <laughs> you, the people that are watching it think it's amazing. Mm. So, and, and then it's like, but I don't want a big note. I don't want to, you know, seem like I'm trying to make something bigger than it really is. And which is, it seems to be, that seems to be a very, you know, Australian slash even more so Tasmanian trait. So that's, that's the challenge we have, mm. is not, it's just finding people who will actually tell us what they're doing mm. rather than talking, it, talking it down. Yeah. In the yeah. same way that in the same way that scientists will always qualify what they're saying because science is never absolute, you know, and that's but that doesn't make for good storytelling because you want to be told things, you know. So if you if you say something amazing and then you qualify it at the end, it's like, oh let down. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So that so it's that, you know, trying to make it so it's still hundred percent truthful, but 
moves on rather than always just doing this little, little emotional sort of roller coaster sort of thing. Yeah. What comes next after? Like if you've got multiple projects ongoing, I presume. Yeah, and I. <laughs> <laughs> they're just up here, aren't they? They're just yeah. It's a, we're constantly it's, working. We're constantly developing. But it's it's a, the the whole industry is in a complete state of flux. You mm. know, like so, there's no money in broadcast anymore. So that used to be the traditional place you'd go to. You know, if you had an idea, you'd pitch it to a, one of the broadcasters, and they'd fund it, and off you'd go and make the film. That's all changed now. So they're also there's just all these ideas, and it's just finding ones that have enough. Parts that you know the story's good enough, but then there's you can find you can sort of dream up a way that it could potentially be funded. So it's just a matter of waiting to see what comes next. You know, we've got a couple of big projects that we're developing, but they're probably the, the most sketchy of ever happening just because mm. they're big and you know, need money and need to go through a much more formal process. Mm. But small, smaller projects just you know present themselves, are you know, just a little bit hard to know. Mm -hmm. But we're definitely the authors of our own destiny. I mean, Tasmania, so many um, shows on television, I mean, how many are about Tasmania? How many stories are about Tasmania? I mean, we're at this small island, but we have rich stories to tell. And I just think, you know, regardless of what a broadcaster says, we just do it. We just make it. We find a way to do it. And we find a way to tell the stories. And suddenly, you know, people are watching them. The films around the country, around the world. Um, yeah, mm. just keep doing it and keep finding partners to to share that journey. Yeah, there's, we can always make another film about Paul Pritchard around right Always. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely another sequel. <laughs> I saw him. The that's right. Guy, yeah. No, that's yeah. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and the thing with that story, you know, like it's a ten-minute film, but it's been shown in over forty countries on every continent, Antarctica. It's just mad. It yeah. just keeps on going. <laughs> so, I mean, and and who knows what comes back to us, you know, specifically from that, but. You know, something good will happen, and those films led to you know Paul being nominated and winning the Australian Adventure of the Year. So now he's doing more speaking to us, so that's giving him a bit of an income. Mm. But it's also really good for getting out, you know, disability advocacy out there. So it's like that's great. You know? mm. And recently, we were contacted by a group in was it uh, Smithton that were doing work with at-risk teenage girls that they wanted to show them a film that had a strong female lead. You know, in a place nearby, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, Albatross Island's yeah. like a winner. Yeah. So you know, and who knows if it makes any difference? <laughs> but if it makes this much difference, I'm all for it. You know. Well, the problem is, uh, who knows what that means? You know. <laughs> but yeah, I'm always. Just, we get a lot of great feedback from people that. Like, like I said before, the audiences, particularly, you know, just from a, people just love seeing films about Tasmania. Tasmanians love watching Tasmanian content, you know. You, you just ask John Kelly, if you've got a Tasmanian film, it's like, I'll put it on the screen until they stop coming, and he knows that people will turn up to watch them. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that's one thing, but then there's also, yeah, we just get anecdotally different bits and pieces, and, and um, oh, there's been, you know, nothing's absolute, but I know that, the, the building the profile of Albatross Island has, has certainly helped in them getting some more funding and things like that. You know, it's not hasn't been responsible for it, but it has it definitely hasn't hurt. What about the Gunners film? How did that come about, and what did you get from it? Well, it actually so all we've made is we've got a ten minute trailer, so we we raised enough money to do all the interviews, but then we could never get any finance to actually make the film, so we got stuck in that bind where we couldn't make the film while it. Well, we could do the interviews and things because um, we crowdfunded for the interviews. But then when we went to broadcasters, it was right at a point in the industry where one, they have no money because the ABC and SBS don't have any cash anymore, really. Um, and basically, the you need a broadcaster, otherwise you're not going to get you know funding from state bodies. So it's a chicken and egg kind of scenario. 
So without just going and making the whole film by ourselves. But the idea for that was to be like a feature length doco, so mm. you know, it's a lot of money to do it properly. Mm. So yeah, that's you know, that's just one of those ones that never quite got somewhere. But we still have an amazing you know, we're still thinking about different ways to reversion all the interviews, you know, whether it's a website with just you know, I think we've interviewed 15 people now from quite a broad spectrum, so it's still quite a legitimate way to tell the story by just editing the interviews down and putting them online so people can actually watch all the different views from, you know, lots of different angles and things. Mm. So it's just different ways to skin a cat, so to speak. Mm. Do you, um, at some point, put your films online? Like, if I want to go and watch the Albatross film, can I do that? Yes. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> They're on Vimeo. So on Vimeo we're on Vi right. yeah, Vimeo Pro. Yep. Yep. We've got we get about two cents. Just a little something. Yeah. Yeah. A little yeah. kernel. Yeah, like, yeah. Three dollars. A couple of dollars or something, and we get fifty cents. Like <laughs> yeah. But you know, the, the cool thing with that, you know, so the on, that on, online sort of market is that it's, you know, it, it's small return, but you're trying to find a massive audience. So the idea is that we get a couple of dollars, but. 300,000 people watch it, I'm fine with it, you know. <laughs> but so basically it's a, we make, we generally make the films for an organisation or, yeah, so doing it scared is a bit different, but, you know, films like The Convoy or um, The Returning Patrol and stuff, so they're sort of made for an NGO, so they go through that, that little life. Yeah. And generally at the same time or not long after that, we put them out to film festivals because the more film festivals they go in, the more you're getting the message out, so it's, it's kind of like just spreading the message. And then after it's done that whole circuit, because film festivals generally won't take it if people can just go watch it online, because why would you go buy a ticket? So when it's done through all that sort of stuff, then you, you stick them online, so that it's our, sort of, our online catalogue is slowly growing, but it's usually a couple of years after the film's come out sort of thing. Yeah. Has the Stroke Foundation been in touch with you, by chance? We should... Stroke. No, we had, we Walk for Stroke is coming up in November, so oh, okay. you might want to send them a... Yeah, see, there's always something. There's always <laughs> something. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I, I don't know, I'm, have you ever thought about the Indigenous, one of the Indigenous really powerful ways of healing is uh, trauma therapy, is to story, just in storytelling. And it strikes me that, particularly with guns, um, Tasmania needs to heal, mm -hmm. and that story could be part of um, a trauma therapy mm -hmm. for, the, for the island. And I don't know who you would, how that works exactly, but it's just an idea I'm throwing in. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, um, and also that to work with, like, there's a, there's someone wants you to teach us the trauma therapy, and they teach the storytelling, and whether um, there is avenues for collaborating in those things. In that learning way, and in the learning, in the in the, in the way of you know, stories have not traditionally through hands on red law or westerns, mm -hmm. but but they've always been used by First Nation people, um, by Indigenous people, um, to explain the world and to heal. Yeah. Mm, so that's a good idea. finding somewhere in that yeah. in that space. Um, yeah, the guns one's very tricky because it's so intertwined with government. You know, it's very hard to find a, a, a weakness <laughs> or a, you know, a way to get it funded that isn't, you know, someone doesn't feel like they're going to be compromised, so there's a mm. lot of, you know, other than just getting a wad load of cash from a philanthropist or something, it's quite difficult to, to, to sort of make it. And then, and then for us, it's like, you know, I can't say, can I have $100,000, hand on my heart, it'll be shown on television because I can't control that. Mm. So then it's, you know, it's all that sort of thing. So yeah, it's, it's tricky because I don't, you know, we we are building relationships with people that want to fund films and you know that or, or care about say the environment for example and want to fund films about you know so matching up causes with you know people that want are interested in those causes. So people that want their stories told. Yeah, yeah, or want or want not so much their stories but stories about something they're passionate about you know to affect social change or whatever. So you've got to be very careful and mindful that you don't over promise. Um, and and you don't bug people for things that clearly they're not interested in, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. So it's just finding the right match. It's fine. So so part of the, you know so part of that we have all these projects ideas coming in, but it's like part of the mix is like finding the a film that has the right 
you know, oh, this is a film that so-and-so would be interested in being, you know, collaborating with, whether that's helping us make it financially or helping us make it in some other way. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why one film gets made and another one doesn't. It feels yeah. like um, it comes from community. It's actually sometimes it's not even a decision. I mean, these things, mm -hmm. the, the energy comes from out there and then kind of comes here. <laughs> and then we just spend our lives actually making it happen. So do you know what I mean? It's like this, um, with the guns story, I think one of the reasons why we haven't actually completed that is because the story hasn't yet ended. I think that it's still ongoing. I think these issues are still there. Cable car, for example, salmon industry, for example, forest deforestation, for example, forest still thing. going. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. it's very difficult to tell so, because you know what is the story? It's just it's yeah. never ending. So it's giant. It's actually giant. And I think for us as filmmakers, I mean, you can see we make a lot of content and it's not about time or energy really, but it's about our spirit, our, you know, what we put in and invest into these stories ourselves. So we need community to bring that to us as well. We, it's, a, it's an engagement. So to give us the energy to be the vehicle to tell that story. So I think that that is the next big thing for us to do. I think that we've got some big stories to tell and they're definitely on our agenda. But I think that it will, it, the point will be forced when community actually, you know, gives us that energy to and works with us to create, to create yeah, it's, that. Yeah, it's that idea of whether, you know, every, every story, it, you know, time, it's, it, the time comes for that story sort of thing. So yeah. that's when it, that's just one of the things you can't really plan, it just happens. Yeah, and I'm so on with that healing idea too. I think that that's exactly right. And I think that that's, I think that that's what we're doing here in Tasmania too, is actually telling stories about our own identity now more than we ever have. And we're, we've got that pride now, now our strong will to do that and desire to do that, because we know we don't want to lose these precious things that we love. And so there's a real effort to be doing that right now. So is that part of the trend? The question I was going to ask before you even said that was, um, have you noticed a change over the years in the stories people want to hear? Uh, like the simplistic level, you had you know, World War II movies in the 60s, and then you had Cowboys and Westerns in the 70s, and then you had science fiction. Mm -hmm. That's a really simplistic level. But have you noticed a shift? Yeah, definitely. I noticed yeah. on the ground, like yeah. formally, like there's this whole, you know, Tasmanian Gothic idea, which personally I don't really buy into, but that's the sort of things that are getting funded from a, you know, on high. So, so that's what the TV series are all about and stuff. But last year, for the last, what, eight months or something, we packaged all of our films together. So that's like an hour and a half, um, you know, screening and toured them around. And, Way more people come to see the films than come to see us talk about making films, you know. <laughs> like, we just, we've just been showing them in town halls and you know at, at, at council, you know, auditorium and stuff, and they're they they're really popular. So it seems like you know the those big theme things that you, you see on Netflix and stuff that are being made in Tasmania, which you know, which is great. But so there's people who sort of want to watch that or being told because there's all the marketing around that. But I think there's this huge interest in just local stuff. Mm. You know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's universal. I don't think that's a Tasmanian thing. I think people are interested in where they live just on a human level. I just don't think mm. they get that much content because everything becomes so homogenised now. Mm. So it's all, we're, you know, like we're basically just making Scandi Noir films in Tasmania now, right? but we've already seen 400 episodes of everything that's ever been made up there. Mm. So people, when you show them something that's local and they can relate to, Mm. That, and, and everyone sort of knows the plots, you know, you've got to do something outrageous to but people go, oh, I kind of knew that was going to happen in the end anyway. <laughs> so, it's, yeah, I think it's... What about the politicisation of a film, like a, a film that's a political film, it's got a political message or an environmental message or something, um, you're never going to get funding through a state screen body. Um, I've certainly pitched myself something and they've got... No, as soon as they've figured out where it's going. 
Yeah. Um, I imagine that Tasmanian Gothic stuff is being funded because it's completely apolitical and it's telling a story that's palatable to a funder. What's the answer? Yeah, I would also... It's, it's yeah. because it's commercial. Yeah, and it's... And that's, it's the, that's the symbol. It's easy to explain, really. you know, yeah. like, it's like it's... Politicians like building things they can stick their names on and but, big but, films are the same. But you know? Tasmanians want to see Tasmanian documentaries. They want to see these stories that are actually political or have a message, a social message, yet they're not allowed to be funded in the same way a drama is. But they'll still see it. They'll still want to see it. So the appetite's there that, the, that there's a disconnect in the funding. Definitely. Yeah, that's, no, I, that's politics, unfortunately. Yeah, the difference between yeah. arts, culture and commercial... You know, and unless um, the that particular arts festival or something is a commercial one, then a pile of money will go into it. I'm not mentioning Mona or anything, but <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, and that's how that yeah. works. But you're absolutely right. We have an appetite for our own stories, and we we have an appetite for our own culture, and um, it's up to us to keep breathing life into that and keep advocating that we want culture and arts to be supported. You Have know. you had any success through DFA, Documentary Foundation Australia, or is that not a thing? No, uh, we, we looked at a few of their programs, but they just didn't really fit for the, the things we were doing at the time, so... Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of what we're already doing. I mean, that, it's kind of like a funnel for people to invest in a project that they, um, yeah, want mm. to actually get involved with. So we have had a couple of things on there, but um, I think that we've had far more reach actually with our own networks of people. Yeah, because you know that it's about relationships and building trust. So people aren't going to, you know, you've either got to have a topic that people really care about, like guns, was a topic that a lot of people are very passionate about. So we got a lot of funding, but in lots of small amounts, <laughs> and you know, given to us in a very passionate way with amazing comments and stuff like that. Um, but other, you know, larger, you know, f other films have been funded by less people, philanthropists, whatever, and their, their personal relationships, people don't just come out of the blue and go, look, we do a bam. Mm -hmm. You know, that, it's, that's about trust. It's no different to the trust you're building with the people you're making the film about. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's, that's, so that's the funny, you know, the dance or the mix. You need to find people that, you know well enough and they trust you, you trust them to, because you've got to trust them to, they're going to give you some money, but then they're not going to start deciding they've got editorial control. So there's that as well. So you sort of have all of that going on. At the same time, you've got the same thing with the people you're making the film about, that you're, you're trying to make a film that's as truthful as possible without burning them, you know? So, so and that's one of the issues we had with the, the lowest to highest, you know? These guys, we start filming, they're like, what if you make us look bad? And we're like, well, that's we don't we will, we don't want to do that. And they're like, well, how do we know? And it's like, excellent question. <laughs> you know? Particularly with two of them, we met. We didn't meet them until we started the trip. So we had a you know a really long relationship with Paul and a couple of the other guys, but the two guys we didn't, and they were you know completely understandably nervous about you know. And I'm, my policy is film everything because you can't film it after it's happened and. You know, it's all about trust and you build it in the edit. But you don't want to say you think you needed something, you didn't have it. And, and also, it's such a learning experience. And by the time you get to the end of the film, ideally, if everything goes well, everyone involved will trust everyone. And if there's anything I'm worried about, it's just bridge too far or whatever, you just, you know, you ring them up or get them in and, you know, get some feedback. But if you don't have it to start with, you know... You've got nothing, so it's yeah. It's just that's always there's a lot of toing and froing and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so you've got to be quite careful that and, and just careful you don't accidentally do something in the heat of the moment, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> it hasn't happened so far that I know of. <laughs> but yeah, and we get it. We get it all the time from other. You know, it's it's. And that's one of the issues with getting a broadcaster involved because there'll be someone that doesn't actually, they're not hands on, and they'll be going, We need more tension. It's like, We know that, but we can't, artificial, well, can't you make that person do that? You know, and you get all, because they're the ones supplying the money, and you're under this pressure to start trying to make something happen that, or make something look worse than it really was, so that there's a, you know, a, a narrative arc that didn't really exist. 
Exactly. Like you bring your horses or something like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, so it's just, yeah, you've got to be careful. I usually find humour works just, you know. <laughs> find out a way to make it pay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just yeah, the arts in general. Yeah. Yeah. Obvious, yeah. 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 You know, making, but that, you know, you can still survive. You continue yeah. to yeah. fortune. Yeah. And, and I'm not sure that, I don't, I'm not sure it, it's ever going to be possible to, I just don't think it's, you know, I'm not convinced, I guess, that there is a way to make a truckload of money doing this, but it's, it's definitely good. possible to make it work. Definitely yeah. can make it work, yeah. And, and I think we, we would be doing anything else if it was about actually <laughs> making a huge amount of money. Sorry. It's true. Ourselves. I mean, the money goes into the production. It goes into getting it out there. That's, that's what, it, what it is about. I know I think what I've learned is the biggest thing about filmmaking, taking yourself out of the picture. That, that's what literally what we've done in a way. We've taken ourselves out of the picture because the story and the audience, you know, is paramount. And, um, yeah, it's not, us, it's not about us becoming famous people, I guess is what I'm saying. It's not about that. If you, if you let go of that ambition, it's amazing how much work you can do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're doing what you love, and you love Yeah, it. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The only the only frustration is when when there's things that are stopping you. You know, like whether it's you know or not being able to get access to a topic that you didn't think is really interesting, and you know, or or not being able to get the funding to make the film you want, or whatever. You know, that's that's where there's the frustration. But but other than that, you know, there's no end of fantastic things to go chasing. Mm. Just sometimes they get away from you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>